sit back, relax, and listen to my voice as we explore the law of God's and chains together. And bear with me for my English skills. I'm not from America, I'm not from England, but hopefully I will get better, my skills will improve, and it will be more joyous to listen to me read as we progress in this series. It's difficult to describe the gods, and more difficult still to describe their citadel, but I will try. You've seen the, you've seen the statues of them in temples, of course. Incorruptible Theriel, cast in marble with his sword and circlet and widespread wings. <clears throat> Vengeful auras, granite carved and iron clad, firefly glinting of his chain of broken crowns. Gentle Aona, made of living wood. Dressing herself for each season in turn. To mortal worshippers, the statues are the gods. Terrible and beautiful. These statues are the pale shadow of blazing truth. Even when the gods themselves grace the surface of Yukos, they are but echoes. The greatest glory and power our little mortal world can host. But only echoes, nonetheless. Here in the citadel, one sees the truth of it. A god is an idea personified, a manifestation of one of the six domains of power that underlie the cosmos. Does Theriel wear a circlet in, a, in this place? In his truest form? Yes, but it is the halo of a sun-crowned mountaintop. He has wings, but they are cumulus clouds billowing across a turbulent sky. His sword is a ray of burning light. To look into his eyes is to stare into the sun and be blinded. Even the, even the choice of he or she is decided by historical convention, more than literal fact. And the citadel, it is the highest of nine realms, a place created by all six gods together as neutral ground. Here, the immense power can converge without worry of, unwan of unwanted destruction, without interruption by the short-lived passions of mortals. The floor is smooth stone but it reflects things that are, not ple that are not present, and some cannot be. Columns reach up into the infinite distance, supporting the sky above. Between the columns, one glimpses other places, a hallway elsewhere in the, citadels, in the citadel from one angle, a storm-tossed sea from another, a proscenium at Parthen from a third. Great chains stretch at angles from the floor, vanishing between the columns <clears throat> and the and past columns are windows to the stars the other realms lie far below the citadel or so the scholars say but here one looks straight out into the cosmos and sees them each revolving slowly around yukos or around the citadel none can say only this place can house all the gods in their fullness without shaking to pieces. The sight, of one of the, god, the sight of one god inspires awe and terror. The sight of all six, together for the first time in mortal memory, in the seat of their splendor, is overwhelming. Yet, here they are. I will use the present tense, no matter when you read this, or what has happened since. I cannot bring myself to write Theriel was. Gods are. It is their nature. In any case, let us hear what they have to say. My siblings, our wayward brother, has returned at last, booms Theriel. The god of light, he shines from within, blazing down on Yukos, winds with the proud heat of summer. There is no applause, no commentary. They already know. Illyrian, god of magic, stands beside Theriel. He is hooded with night he is hooded with night and robed in fog. His eyes are twin stars, distant and cold and brilliant. If he if he's looking at the others, it is only to peer through them, at things only he can see. He is the wayward brother, missing for centuries in the great chaos beyond the known realms, and he seems content to let Theriel speak for him. Off to one side sits Aona, god of nature. The poet tells us, the poets tells us, truthfully, that flowers bloom in her footsteps, and her smile brings life and laughter to the world. 
but today she is brooding, dangerous. In, Ar- in Armonia, far below, the Amazons find that their horses will heat them, and, gre- and great wolves howl in the woods. Welcome back, dear brother, says Melissus, god of death. Her voice is the whisper of wind over a lifeless desert, her skin the color of long-forgotten bones. I shudder to think what would happen if I abandoned my realm for even a single year. How fortunate that your own domain spun on without your you for hundreds. If it could not, if it couldn't, I would not have left, says Illyrian. Her tone does not seem to bother him. Brooding auras sit with Melissa's war of war and death casually intertwined. Perhaps they are lovers at the moment. And lest that though distress you, know that for all their talk of brothers and sisters, the gods are no more kin to one another than the tides are to the mountains. Yes, welcome back, yells Aurus. The thunder echoes through the peaks of Karkin. Is that why you've called us here? To announce something we can all see as plainly as a date, I'm star? As a daytime star, he gestures beyond the pillars, where a comet still blazing in the skies of Yukos. It was Illyrian's chariot, bearing him home from the stars beyond the stars. Far below the philosophers and sages still debate what is portents, ranging from the esoteric to the apocalyptic. Only one of them has guessed the truth and they have not spoken it aloud. Theriel smiles, but it is the cold, thin light of the sun shining through fog. The occasion deserved to be recognized, says Theriel, but then he nods in acknowledgement. That is not the only reason we are gathered. An explanation then, growls Iona, her eyes feral. Illyrian, where have you been? The sixth god at last, her words dripping with honey and malice. Yes, says Lydia. The god of deception, as a voice like steel and silk whispers, no. I'd say you owe of all of us an explanation. The assembled gods begin to speak at once, a a cacophony cacophony of conflicting energies. Children squabbles. The world over suddenly turn ugly. In Tartessos, a man kills his brother for reason he will not remember later. I'll admit I'm curious. Don't care what he was up to. Abandon us. Abandon me. Illyrian holds up a hand, and the gods fall silent. At his wordless command, the the columns around them fall away, and the starry cosmos swells around them. What is the great chaos, he asks. Aura snorts like a bull. Aeona looks away. Melissa sighs heavily. The last rattling breaths of a hundred living things tumbling from her lips. They are not in the mood for sophistry, little brother, says Theriel. Tell them. Very well, says Illyrian. You've all seen the great chaos, felt it, beneath and around the other realms. You know that it eats away at form and structure. That we call the cosmos a bubble of corn in a vast sea of disorder with no apparent boundary. So you say, Aeona replies. There's nothing beyond the cosmos. I knew this obsession would lead you astray. Illyrian continues, as though she had not spoken. These facts are self-evident, he says, and like many self-evident facts, they are incorrect. It's been so long, says Melissa. I'd forgotten just how boring you are when you're declaiming. There is order, beyond our realms, says Illyrian. The stars and constellations are proof enough of that, but there is far but there is far more out there. Patterns and echoes. I've been studying them in the hopes of learning more about the cosmos, perhaps even about our own origins. Enough, says Theriel. I told you, brother, they don't care. It has always been your role to explore the limits of you, of our understanding and the hidden truth they contain. 
The others care only for temporal things. Melissa scoffs at that and sounds like the bark of hyena. <laughs> Melissa scoffs at that and sound like the bark of a hyena. Aeona snarls. Very well, says Illyrian. I shall keep my own counsel. I can't say I've missed your collective indifference to my discoveries. Is that it then? Asks Ludia, as a voice whispers that's all. A family reunion and a lesson in cosmology. No, says Theriel. I will show you the purpose of this meeting. Theriel's eyes flare and the starry cosmos recedes, replaced by a vast and gleaming arena. The sun beats down on it, as though they were far below on Yukos. Aura stands, and swords across Yukos loose in their scabbards, eager for war. What is it? asks Aeona. This is the grand arena, says Theriel. His words ring out like a hammer on iron. Indel- indelibly? Mm, I don't know that word. <laughs> Fixing the name to the thing. Then we are to fight, says Oros, in a voice that seems torn between hunger and lust. No, says Iona. The last time... No, says Theriel. Never again. Melissa blows Theriel a kiss. The sun dims just a moment, and mortals across Yukos feel a sudden chill. Fast, says Oros. What then? Shall we touch javelins and hold foot races? This place... We'll toast a tournament, says Theriel. Each of us shall choose a mortal champion to embody our ideals and take on a portion of our power. There is precedent, adds Illyrian, in the distant past. Yes, says Aurus, yes. Another demigod says war. There will be no war, says Theriel. Each champion will receive a trial, chosen by one god, aside from their patron, subject to approval by the other four. Those, those who fail, those who fail the trial, fail the test. What of those who succeed? Asks Ludia. Fail? Do you plan to name a winner? Fastest, strongest, most elegant. The answer will be obvious. We will vote if necessary, says Illyrian. And what if we refuse to participate? Asks Melissa. It's your right to forfeit, says Theriel. And why? Why this arena? asked Aurus. The Grand Arena exists simultaneously here on, and on Yukos, so that we and our mortal champions may all attend. A back door to the Citadel, says Melissa. You had no right. That's unnatural, says Iona. It's wrong. It's not a door, says Illyrian. More like a mirror. To the mortals, it is part of Yukos. To us, it is part of the Citadel. That will that we will seem to stand together is an illusion. Theriel's eyes flare again, and the arena recedes, replaced by the citadel. Your question can wait, he says. You choose your champions, or for feet. Theriel turns to Illyrian. Come, we have much to discuss. He spreads his wings and flies away to some distant part of the citadel. Illyrian surveys the four remaining guards his starlight eyes lingering on Aeona. It is good to be back, he says. And then, in a swirl of mist, he is gone. He too is gone. Aurus and Melissa lounge in... What? Aurus and Melissa lounge in on one of the Citadel's mini gallery <laughs> galleries, looking out over the cosmos. I don't like it, rumbles Aurus. It is night on Yukos, when warfare gives way to sub... Subterfuge and fire more readily yields to mortal will. At night he is less impetuous, more brooding. So you said, replies Melissa. Perhaps we should decline to participate. But that might play right into his hands, says Aurus. He's really not that deep, says Melissa. He may have hidden motives. But if he invited us, it's because he wants to ex- us to accept then we should decline, roared Oros, as a pig fat drips into a thousand fires. That will show him. It was clever of him, though, to tie the contest up to Yukos, says Melissa. If we, if, we, if we refuse, we lose a chance of our champions to gain glory among the mortals. Oros grunts. 
I do like the thought of my champions knocking the sunny smile off his champion's face. Of course you do, says Melissa. Maybe we should ask Lydia if Iona enters and she is and she is a great stack, a wild boar, the sudden fury of summer storm, antlers and tusks and tusks curl around her head, and smells of blood and ozone and freshly turned to death. <laughs> Let me read that again, my bad. Antlers Let's just that. Aona enters, and she is a great stag, a wild boar, the sudden fury of a summer storm. Antlers and tusks curl around her head, and she smells of blood and ozone and freshly turned earth. On you coast, the night is thick and ominous, and people huddle close around their fires. Well, well, says Melissa. Aona speaks, but is but it is the roar of a hungry bear, the howl of a wind. The howl, the howl of a wind whipping the treetops. All anger and no sense. These descriptions of Aona, man, they're not easy to read. Or at least to me. Let me take some water. <sighs> Always good to see your primal sight, says Oros. What's troubling you? asks Melissa. Aona breathes deeply. The storm subsides, though the air still crackles with pent-up anger. Illyrian, she says. Melissa moves aside, making room for Aona between herself and Oris. Aona sits. Go on, says Melissa. We've always been close, says Aona. When he focuses on real things, the magic of dryads, the magic of a dryad's grove, or a siren song, our domain overlaps in harmony, like you do. Like yours do. Oh my god, man, that sentence. Or even yours and mine, Melissa. But, says Melissa. But he can never leave it at that, says Iona. Illyrian and his philosophers debate whether motion exists. When all they need to do is watch the rush of a waterfall. All the bounding of a fawn. It's maddening. I know, below. I know, Bellows Horus. Makes you want to ram a spear right into their guts and ask them again if they believe in motion. Melissa's glasses at him. <laughs> Melissa's glares at him, and he falls silent. He is obsessed with the idea that there's something beyond the cosmos, says Iona. I begged him to keep his attention here, on earth and sky and sea. On things that are real, I told him it was dangerous. That his prodding could unravel something vital. That perhaps the cosmos needs to remain a mystery. Even to us. Maybe especially to us. And sometimes he listened. We strolled among the stars and planted sacred groves together. But more and more he didn't. And then he was gone. Vanished into his great chaos. With barely a goodbye and no indication when he'd be back. There's something you could have done, says Melissa. It is his nature. There's nothing you could have done, says Melissa. It is his nature. And now, says Iona, now he returns, talking more nonsense about the cosmos than ever. And who does he speak to? Theriel, says Melissa. And in her mouth, it is an obscenity. obscenity. Magic and light, shining together, says Iona. The, do the domains of the gods, taking on strange harmonies. I worry about abomination they may illuminate and the shade they will cast. You think the two of them are planning something, says Melissa. That is my fear, says Aona. We must stop them, bellows Aurus. He slams his first he slams his fist on a stone and the stone cracks. Below an earthquake rattles the desert sands of Thanacris. Yes, says Melissa. Do you think this contest do you think this contest is part of their plan? That or it is meant to distract us from their true plan, says Aona. Maybe the contest is a ruse and the arena is the key. Enough second guessing, says, Ar says Aurus. We will crush their trials. If they have plans beyond that, we will crush those too. Then we agreed on this, asked Melissa. All three of us. Aurus and Melissa look to Aona. The moon, the moon hangs heavy in the sky. Agreed, says Aona, linking the three together with word and will. Behind them, a shadow flits out of sight. In, an, in, a, 
In another corner of the citadel, far from the great windows and on the cosmos, Theriel and Illyrian confer. It is night. When the sun hides and the stars shine, Theriel lights a stem, his voice less resounding. The others don't seem enthusiastic about this contest, says Illyrian. We don't require their enthusiasm, says Theriel, only their compliance. Compliance. And what if they refuse? They will not, says Theriel. They cannot allow our champions to stand before the people while they name, other, while they name no champions at all. That makes sense, says Illyrian. But they are not always sensible, Aurus in particular. Aurus is the most predictable of all, says Theriel. He speaks of chaos, yet yields to the same desires at every opportunity. He will fight, as surely as Lydia lies. Now and then, now then, the arena. It is ready, says Illyrian. I don't think any of them have the understanding to deduce its true nature. One does, says, Ither- says Theriel. Ludia, says Illyrian. Ludia, says Theriel. The name is discordant, anathema to his nature. He blazes with the full light of the sun, casting sharp shadows. She is here, he says. Show yourself, Ludia. Latha drifts through the room, like the ringing of unseen chimes, as Ludia steps out from the shadows, from the shadow of a marble column. The hint of a smile is vis- vi- the hint of a smile is visible behind her mask, but only to Illyrian. She hides her face from Theriel, because even if she is not certain whether she can lie to him. Let's, let me take that again. She hides her face from Theriel, because even she is not certain whether she can lie to him. Plotting without me, brothers, she says. You trespass my domain. Leave, says Theriel, now. All six gods shall travel freely throughout the citadel, says Ludia. <clears throat> that has always been the law. Do not quote the law at me, spits Theriel. You ignore it when it does not favor you. True, says Lydia. But you don't. What do you want, Lydia? Ask Lil- asks Illyrian. You two are hiding something, says Lydia. But you're not very good at it, I'm afraid. Even our trusting little fawn, Aona, can see it. What of Aona? Ask, asks Illyrian. She's furious. She's furious with you. Auras and Melissa have welcomed her. And the three are united in opposition, among other things. That is not an answer, says Theriel. State your business. I want to help you, says Lydia. Theriel's eyes flare with sunlight, Illyrian's with starlight, as they search for any sign of deceit from the god of deception. Help us, help us with that. Help us with what? asks Illyrian. Why? With whatever it is you're really trying to do, says Lydia. Because it is my nature, I suppose. That is a lie, says Theriel. And his words are undis- and his words are, are as undeniable as a slab of granite. You have ulterior, you have ulterior motives. Of course I do, says Lydia. That is my nature as well. But I do want to help you. Truly? Asked Illyrian. That much is the truth, says Theriel. Let me, let me in on your little conspiracy, says Lydia. I can hide it better than you can. And the others will never suspect I'm helping you. Swear that you will help corro- Swear that you will help. No, swear that you will cooperate with our plans, says Theriel. Swear that you will tell no one. And you will. And that. And that you will not work against us. She can make no promise of that we can trust, says Illyrian. Swear it, Ludia, says Theriel. I will know if you're lying. No, my dear, says, L- says Ludia. You'll know if I'm telling the truth. That which is not truth is falsehood, says Theriel. Ludia laughs. You're a poor thing. You really do believe that, don't you? Gods do not believe, says Theriel. I know. Now, swear or leave my presence. Very well, says Ludia, raising one hand in a mockery of a solemn oath. Reveal your plan to me, and I swear not to reveal its existence, nor its particulars, to anyone, God or otherwise, otherwise, nor to the work across purposes, to your plans as revealed to me. It is done, says Theriel, 
With his words, something settles into place. A link forged in a chain that will bind them both. Now then, says Ludia, what's this all about? I learned a great deal out in the darkness, says Illyrian, about nature of this, co about the nature of this cosmos, and more to the point, about the fate of the creations that preceded preceded it. Ludia's presence seems to grow to fill the little room as she inhales the heavy scent of a true cosmic secret. Preceded, she breath she breathes. Then our memory of the creation, of how all this came to be, they are false. They are accurate, says Delirium, but incomplete. They are echoes. Out there is darkness. Out there are echoes. Out there in the darkness. Patterns. Those patterns suggest that those patterns suggest that there were other acts of creation be before our own other gods whom we do not remember. Because our memories was tampered with, says Ludia, without conviction. No, Ludia, says Illyrian, because we did not yet exist. These words ripped through the amper air of the citadel, screaming and howling at their own unspeakable truth. Ludia shies away. Ludia shies from them. Even Theriel winces in a gallery across the, tit the citadel. The trio of gods do not notice. Their attentions consumed with sealing their covenant. But across Yukos, among those being those minds are open to the truth. Children, artists, sages, animals. A few cry out in their sleep, aware that something, somewhere, is wrong. Ludia moves her mask aside. She is no longer smiling. Tell me everything. And that is the first chapter of the Law of Gods Unchained. Citadel of the Gods. My reading is not perfect yet. yet. <laughs> and obviously my pronunciation is not perfect yet. But we will move towards that. We will improve for every every time we discover this together i hope you will subscribe and like if you like this video i will upload this second chapter soon <laughs>